when we are performing a minimization, we are performing it over all possible functions that satisfies a certain criterion. And these all possible functions is what we call the space. And uh, here, I'm going to give two examples of that space over here. So the first example is x is the space. And the space is a set of functions. It's a collection of functions that satisfy a certain criterion. For example, is f of x, uh, is of f of x, x between 0 and 1, such that for all i, OK, so I'm, um, so for all the i's, we are still representing the space using a finite number of intervals. And these intervals are now what we call elements. And for reasons I'm going to discuss a little bit later, let's now, instead of labeling the elements as integers, let's label the element boundaries as integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So for all the i's, Let's see, fx is linear in x in xi minus 1 and xi. OK, so this is one class of functions. So can somebody tell me, does this correspond to this case or the previous case? This one, right? Because I'm no longer requiring my x to be continuous. So, so for example, when i is equal to 1, when x is in x0 and x1, the function is linear like this. In between 1 and 2, the function can be like that. OK, so I, ha I can have a function that is like that to approximate whatever function I want to approximate. The second case, which is the case we are going to discuss in this lecture, uh, is putting an additional constraint on the function. And f is continuous. Continuous. And for all the i, fx is linear in x i minus 1 and x i. So this is a space that I require the function to be not only piecewise linear but continuous. So these are these kind of uh, uh, piecewise lines that I can draw with one stroke. OK. Now, what I claim is that this space of x satisfies a particular, particularly nice properties called the linearity. So what does linearity mean? Linearity means that if I have x1 and x2 both in the space x, OK, so linearity. So this is not linearity of the function, but linearity of the function space. right? That's different from the linearity of the function f. Linearity of the function f just says like f is a straight line if you plot it. But linearity of the function space is something different. It's saying that for any pair of f1 and f2 in that linear space, a1 times f1 plus a2 times f2 is also in the space for any real numbers a1 and a2. All right. So any linear combination of any two elements in the space also belongs to the same space. That is linearity. So in this case, why is the case? Why is this particular space linear? So let's check it. First of all, if I have a function like that, if I scale the function by a real number, the scaled function Let's say if I scale it to a little bigger, the scaled function would look like that. Of course, it's still continuous. 
And of course, for every interval, the scaled function is also linear, right? So if I have one f1 in x, a1 times f1 is also in x. Again, if I have f2 in x, a2 times f2 is also in x. This is because scaling is invariant, uh, is scaling is, uh, so I mean, the x is invariant to scaling. And also, if I have both a1, f1, and a2, f2 in the space, adding them together, the sum of two continuous functions is continuous. And the sum of two linear functions is linear. So <coughs> a1, f1 plus a2, f2 is also continuous and piecewise linear. Therefore, we can prove that x is a linear space by simply arguing about the properties of the functions uh, it has to satisfy. All right, any questions so far? Okay, now we need to introduce the concept once we have a linear space. A linear space is particularly nice that it has this thing called a basis. Okay, a basis in, in a linear space, x1, x2, all the way to xn, for example, is a basis. So this is a basis of x. If and only if the following properties are satisfied. So first of all, for any x in that linear space, x can be represented as a linear combination of these bases. All right. So this is the first property, but that's not enough. Another property is that for any Another property, let, let me just say like this. Another property is that this representation is unique. So for any x, the, the set of ai's such that x is equal to ai x i, so this is i, is unique. So you can't find two different set of AIs that give you the same X. Okay, for example, this precludes you from, uh, so, so this precludes you from having a basis in which Xn can be represented as a linear combination of X1, X2 to Xn minus one. Because if you can do that, xn is, of course, a member of x, right? And then xn has two different, two different representations. One representation is that xn is equal to a summation where all the ai's are zero except for an, which is one. So xn is equal to xn. And also it has a different representation using only the values x1 to xn minus one. So, the representation of a, a summation of AI is not unique, right? So, so basically, if we have property two, that means any members of the basis cannot be represented as a linear combination of the other members. Okay. Also, it means if we have a basis, we cannot add anything onto the basis. So if we add any other members of x onto the basis, it, it becomes no longer a basis. Because if, if we add another member, that, that additional member would be able to be represented either just as a linear combination of itself or as a linear combination of the previous set of uh, bases. Okay. Any questions so far? So the basis is very useful because 
it reduces an optimization problem. It reduces a least squares problem, just like what we saw before. From a least squares problem in the abstract function space to a least squares problem that a computer can solve. A least squares problem in a bunch of numbers. So, for example, if I want to say I want to minimize the distance, uh, we're going to define what the distance should be before uh, a little bit later. Uh, between the distance between any function f and x for all x in the linear space x. Right, so if we want to solve that minimization problem, it's pretty tricky because I'm minimizing over a function space that I don't know how to uh, how, how to uh, how to choose but I can transform that minimization problem because any X in X can be represented as, as a linear magnetic combination I can minimize over all the possible A's that is in Rn right so so if the basis is of N has N uh, entries the distance between F and that linear combination of Xi so I know I'm minimizing over a space of n numbers, and that is something I can solve with a computer. So that's why basis is useful. Okay. Now let's discuss. Yeah. That's a good question. What if? What if the, the basis is not finite? Actually, for some function spaces, the basis is, is infinite. For example, you can simply choose x to be all functions that are continuous. I don't require x to be piecewise linear or anything. In that case, you actually cannot find a finite set of bases. You can still have a basis, but the basis is going to be an infinite set. It's not a finite set. And in that case, this particular problem cannot be transformed into a finite dimensional optimization problem. That is why in finite element there is this word finite. Okay, we we need to construct because the, the space of functions, as you can see, I can it's it's of my choice. I can choose what function space I want to operate in. Therefore, I need to choose a functional. Uh, I need to choose a function space that I can actually construct a finite set of bases. And that enables me to transform any minimization problem. So this is just for approximating a function, a known function. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit later like how to do the same for approximating an unknown function, which is a solution of a PDE using the same framework. We are also going to be able to translate that into a finite dimensional optimization problem. 